know that I'm used to the climate A thing that if man ever found A place to live easy and happy That Eden is on Puget Sound Eden is on Puget Sound That Eden is on Puget Sound A place to live easy and happy that Eden is on Puget Sound. Hello and welcome to the Seattle Files podcast. My name is Chris Allen. I'm your host. Every week I get together with a different Seattle comedian and together we discuss the interesting, unusual, strange, and oftentimes lesser known aspects of our local history. Joining me today is Alex Grindelin. Hello, Alex. That was Alex <laughs> clapping for himself. Uh, thanks for being here. Uh, tell me, Alex, how long have you lived in Seattle? Uh, a little over four years, Chris. Excellent. And why Why did you come here? Uh, because um, I lived in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, which is a wonderful place, but it's too cold in the winter and too hot and humid and drippy in the summer, so I decided to move somewhere where there wasn't really weather. Okay. Then you made a poor decision, because we have a lot. We don't have a lot of... Uh... There's not much weather here. Okay. Uh, Alex is the owner, manager, and player at Comedy Sports Seattle. You can see them perform every weekend in Fremont. Shows are... Every Friday and Saturday, 8 o'clock and 10 o'clock, CSZ Seattle. Visit seattlecomedygroup.com for more information and a full schedule. What was that website again? seattlecomedygroup.com. Excellent. You can find all the information there, and they perform every weekend in Fremont. Uh, so you've lived out here for about four years. Do mm-hmm. you know much about the history of your adopted homeland? I can't say I do, no. No, you don't. Okay. Just no. from talking to people and... No. And being a person, I have uh, about I, I can if I could, I could harken back to maybe uh, five years worth of history. The last five years, maybe I know. Okay, that. yeah. So a, from a year before you got here, yeah. When I when I looked up Seattle on the internet, oh, okay, excellent. Mm-hmm. You found out that it was in fact a place, mm-hmm. and you looked yeah. at the weather reports. I thought it was. Yeah, it, it, there's not as it, it rains sometimes. Other times you get to wear a hoodie and jeans, and that's what I knew. Um, also, uh, yeah, it's a place. It's not just a. They didn't just make it up for Fraser. That's, they made the skyline up for Frasier. That's true. That's for sure. Yeah. But yeah. Yeah, no, it is, it is an actual place. It physically exists. Mm-hmm. And so you have no idea what we're going to be talking about today. Is that Can't correct? Can't say I do. Excellent. Well, other than the, the previous edit where you had to cut it out because I figured we weren't going to pretend that we weren't going to talk about that, but two seconds ago you had to like cancel. You had to say, Oh, oh no, I messed something up. There was something inaccurate. So I learned there was like some kid who's 14 or something. I know that. Okay. Excellent. <laughs> yeah. well, thank, thank you for bringing that up. We did do a, We did have a false start on this recording. So thank you for mentioning that. that you suck at this. <laughs> apparently I do. So thank you. Thank you for starting off in the first three minutes by pointing out that I suck. That's uh, that's very helpful. Uh-huh. So let's get started. Sure. Uh, Roy Olmsted. Mm, that was the name I heard before. Was born September 18th, 1886 in Beaver City, Nebraska. He came to Seattle at the age of 14 along with his family. That is as far as I got. That was, where were you stopped before? Uh, he got work in the shipyards well, as a, new. This is new. He got work in the shipyards <laughs> as a metal fitter for a few years. Uh, uh-huh. and then he and his brothers Ralph and Frank gained employment as patrolmen with the Seattle Police Department. Oh. So he's a young man with a couple of his brothers working. I kind of like this guy because I worked on in the shipyards when I first moved here. Oh, did you? Yeah. Oh, what, what did you do at the shipyards? I was a parts delivery driver. I, I picked up electronics, parts, and wires from places and brought them to the big industrial fishing boats and delivered them to the boats. Oh, did you like doing that? No, not at all. It was okay. a terrible job. Okay. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Well, he only worked there for a few years, too. And yeah. then he ended up... Then did you get a job as a, a patrolman? Uh, no. A purveyor of comedy. Oh, okay. How's that going? <laughs> Gangbusters, dude. <laughs> Excellent. Uh, Roy worked as a beat cop for many years, <laughs> patrolling the streets and enforcing the city's ordinances that banned gambling, fornication, mm. prostitution, short skirts, and the sale of ice cream on Sunday. <laughs> uh, I, 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 prostitution? Uh, gambling? Fornication? Makes sense. Short makes skirts? Sense. No, no, I'm losing you, I'm losing you. And the sale of ice cream on Sunday. Okay. So if you were a short-skirted prostitute, prostitute eating ice cream and fornicating on a Sunday, you uh, you were you they, were they, they were allowed to shoot you in the back of the head. It was it was a it was a rough rough day for you. Yeah, I just mostly I I giggled earlier because you said he's a beat cop, and that's just a funny combination of words. A beat cop? <laughs> a beat I think cop. that's a pretty standard. <laughs> uh, I've name heard it for before, a... but it still makes me giggle every time. All right, I'm a beat cop. All right, it doesn't matter. 
Uh, he quickly learned that law enforcement could be a much more lucrative enterprise than simply enforcing the law and picking up a paycheck. Mm. If he helped people, they might be inclined to give him a small cash tip. If he looked the other way when walking past an illegal gambling hall, he might also receive a small cash tip, a practice known as taking sugar. Mm. Uh, he also made sure to make the distinction between clean money and dirty money. He, like, on his taxes? No, in, in, in his, in his enterprises as a cop. So okay. if he, like, looked the other way, that might be one thing, but he wouldn't go out and rob people and commit crimes or help people oh, that commit so, okay. crimes. So he, he had a moral set of his own. He did, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, he okay. was, he was like Omar on the wire, where he had a, a certain code that he lived by. That's not gonna work for me, these wire, th I haven't seen the wire. Oh, okay. Yeah, if you're gonna do a code, use Dexter. Like, okay. There's a code. He was, he was not at all like Dexter. Oh. And he didn't, didn't <laughs> murder people. Got it. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, so, but, but he never. So he he made a distinction, but he didn't do dirty money stuff. He didn't do dirty money stuff. Okay. So yeah. he wasn't like helping push the prostitutes. He was just kind of looking the other way. Right. Someone yeah. else was pushing them. Okay. Yes. Exactly. Uh, proving himself as a talented officer, he was promoted to desk sergeant in 1910. A reform movement was hitting the city. The mayor at the time, Hiram Giles, an open city advocate, was the first U.S. mayor in hist history to be recalled by election. Oh. So open city basically meant that there, there was a big push-pull around this time between open city and closed city, where open city uh, advocates were saying we should just kind of look the other way for prostitution and gambling. Closed mm -hmm. city was saying we should crack down on it and try to clean up the streets. Yeah, and so there, there was a big push-pull. So is this after the gold rush? This is after the gold rush. Okay, because yeah. I know the gold rush, the prostitution was, yeah, yeah, Seattle prostitution. There was, yeah. well, even, even at that time, there was still, there was still a, a moral reform movement that was trying to crack down on it. Sure. And so, oh, they, so this, this is an open city mayor. This is an open city mayor. Look the other way mayor. Yeah. And he was, he was recalled. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. And so, but, and the other thing that strikes me interesting is that this guy got promoted by being just d a dirty enough cop. He wasn't super dirty, but he was, he was a little dirty. Yeah. Well, I mean, mm -hmm. I feel like that's how you get promoted, right? Yeah. You don't, you don't go out of your way to be a super dirty cop. Yeah, like no one, no one, uh, uh, well, none of his superiors would promote him. Like it, it'd be like the kid in the hallway at school who tattles on everybody. Even if you're that person's superior and you're like, they're doing good things for me, you don't promote that person. Mm -hmm. if you're not because they're not somebody. They're not a confidant. Right. They're a, a nerd. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, good, good guy, analogy. Guy yes. was not a nerd. Guy was not a nerd. Yeah. Okay. Uh, the ch a police chief was thrown in jail due to corruption, and a genuine effort was made to clean up the city. November third, nineteen fourteen, state initiative measure number three passed in Washington by a margin of fifty-two percent. Now we all know what that is, it's right? A, um, I know what a margin is. Okay, you know what a margin is. So state initiative measure number three was also known as the statewide prohibition initiative. Prohibition had come to Washington State years before the rest of the country. Mm, oh, the, you guys, this this Seattle was a front runner in Prohibition. Uh, Washington State was bunch of nerds, <laughs> bunch of, so state full of nerds. You are redacting your nerd stance. Uh, well, no, this guy, you know, in the aggregate, bunch of nerds. Mm -hmm. Yeah, fifty two percent nerds. Fifty two percent nerds. All right. Yeah. In December of 1917, uh, a constitutional amendment was drafted in Congress outlawing the sale of liquor. By 1919, it had been approved by two-thirds of the U.S. states at the time, and the 18th Amendment went into effect the following year. Midnight on January 16th, 1920, the 18th Amendment and the Volstead Act went into effect, making the manufacture, sale, and shipment of all alcoholic beverages in the United States strictly forbidden. Yeah, I have a question. Yes. Was the guy, was the mayor who was pulled out of office, was he pulled out of office for other reasons other than that he, that he was kind of pro, uh, prostitution, having fun? Uh, that's pretty much, that's the big reason. Okay, so the, he, so he was, he was actually, Hiram Giles was, was, was kicked out of office. He, he was, uh, kicked out by recall. First mm -hmm. major mayor of a U.S. city, of a major U.S. city to be, uh, recalled. A few years later, he ran for mayor again on a closed city ticket and he won. So, okay, wait, wait. So, he got elected in as an open city mayor. Yes. Everyone was like, yeah, open city, yeah, yes. with some pro some boobs and stuff. Drinks yes. and boobs. Drink, and, drinks and boobs. And then, that was his campaign uh, slogan. Uh, two years later or something like that? A few years later, a yeah. A few years later, everyone was like, no drinks, no boobs, get them out. Yes. What? And then, a few years after that, he ran again 
Well, there, there was a lot of there was a lot of push pull going on. So, I mean, the reformers and the, the the temperance movement and things like that were gaining power, losing power. It's just a lot of political push pull like there is today. Movement? Temperance movement was the the prohibition movement. Oh, that was yeah. Okay. The temperance movement was all the people the that were movement. <laughs> were trying to get usually uh, mostly women of the church were were kind of known as the temperance uh, movement. Lady were, nerds. <laughs> you have a very anti nerd stance, don't you? <laughs> like yeah, mm-hmm. as should we all. Uh, Prohibition certainly didn't eliminate alcohol, but it did make it much more expensive. Before Prohibition, a bottle of scotch would cost around $3.50. After the passing of the 18th Amendment, it could run as much as $25. Okay, I did not know that. The Prohibition just raised the price of booze? It made it illegal. And so once it went underground, Uh, everything got a lot more expensive. But that's that's not what happened with weed. Uh, you mean here after the legalization? Yeah. Now that it's legal, it's more, it's, I hear, I don't smoke it, but I hear it's still more expensive to buy it from a store. Is it? Than it is to buy it from a dealer. I don't smoke it either. Uh, I think we're nerds. Yeah. In this case. <laughs> so, yeah. Uh, I, I don't know. I went to one pot shop and I, I didn't, I, I didn't really compare prices I've to street prices. I've had friends come into town and they're all excited about buying weed from a store where you can buy it legally. They go in and they go, oh, cool. And they buy it a little bit, but then it's like, no, I'm still going to buy from the dealer because it's cheaper. So I don't understand the economics of why the booze got more expensive because it's illegal. I I don't know. I couldn't tell you. Uh, I'm I Let's stop the podcast. <laughs> well, I I I, yeah, I I don't know, and I don't know if that's that's going to change over time. Once because mm-hmm. marijuana just became legal, yeah. so I don't know if it's going to over the next. 10 years or so if it's the price is going to drop. But at, at this point, the uh, price of alcohol went up I bet I know why. I bet I know why. Because <coughs> now, now they had to make it up in the hills and there's transportation costs and... Um, it's more. It's not like weed where you can just everybody who sells it grows it in their garage. Oh, most of most of uh, the alcohol we were getting was actually being brought down from Canada. Yeah. Okay. So there's so it was being imported. There's more transportation mm-hmm. costs still, mm-hmm. and there's da- there's um what do they call that uh um uh, when, hazard pay. Hazard pay. Yeah. I hazard yeah. pay. So we'll we'll get to some of that. Okay. Yeah. Uh, if one couldn't afford a decent bottle of booze, the alternatives were few and unpleasant. One could acquire moonshine, but that was tough on the system and often of dubious origin. Mm-hmm. Drug stores were allowed to sell alcohol, but it was tainted with 5% wood alcohol that would poison anyone who drank it. Uh, then there was... What? Drug stores were allowed to sell alcohol? There's medicinal... It was poisoned? Something. I, I'm not sure why, but they were allowed to sell alcohol. Um, oh. But it was... You know how if you have drink like ethyl alcohol, mm-hmm. it'll, it'll kill you, sure. basically? Uh, so they were allowed to sell alcohol, but it had to be ethyl alcohol, but people would drink it. People were so desperate. Oh, yeah, yeah. You see, you see, you hear about homeless people doing that. Yeah, drinking Listerine. like isopropyl alcohol. Listerine or yeah. and stuff. Yeah. Okay, okay, really I get sick. it. Get it. Mm-hmm. Understood. Uh, there was denatured alcohol flavored with creosote and prune juice, which was also poisonous. Uh, operating in a black market, many bootleggers would do everything they could to make their tainted alcohol look like a bottle of top-notch stuff. Many were the men and women who shelled out a small fortune for a bottle of liquor, only to open it and discover it had a horrible smell and made them sick. Americans were on the lookout for a bootlegger or a rum runner they could trust. Yeah. Uh, bootlegging refers to those who run alcohol by cars and rum runners by boats. Oh. It's actually, I, I learned that doing research for this. Um, I would have completely missed that if you not mm-hmm. pointed out. I just thought you were be, 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 being playful with words. Yeah. It, it is, it is fun to say rum runners. Yeah. Or bootleggers. The they runners. are, they are fun words for dealers. That's um, what, that, we shouldn't be the Seattle Mariners. We should be the Seattle, Seattle rum, rum runners? runners. Oh, that'd be awesome. Yeah, that'd be way, uh, I would like the team, I would care more if it was not, well, we're, we, 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 we got boats. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> no, rum runners is cooler. Yeah. Uh, for our purposes, though, I'm just gonna, I'm going to be using them kind of interchangeably. Because, Got it. Because yeah. that's that's, that's what kind of used now. You allow it? Uh, yeah, yeah. So, bootle- but it's not all rum. No, it's not all rum. They just call okay. They just called them rum Yeah, yeah, yeah. So by this point, Roy Olmsted had been promoted to lieutenant at the tender age of 31. He was nicknamed <laughs> the baby <laughs> lieutenant. Wait, how old are you? I'm 33. Still kind of tender. I am. <laughs> You're still kind of tender. I am kind of tender, yes. Uh, I'm all... But I'm also not a high-ranking member of the Seattle Police Department, yeah. so I think that if I was a lieutenant, people would be like, "Wow, he's a young lieutenant." Well, yeah, but tender and young doesn't mean the same. I'm 29. I'm almost tender. <laughs> I'm going to be tender soon. Soon, someday. If you're lucky, <laughs> you'll make it to tender. Uh, he was nicknamed the Baby Lieutenant by his peers because of his youth and soft round features. <laughs> and because he had little baby legs. <laughs> if we left that part out of the story. He's got baby legs. He's got, he's got a regular size upper torso and his legs are baby legs. 
<laughs> do do a Google image search of Roy Olmsted, and you'll you'll find that to be true. That's mm-hmm. um, not true. He was, and he, and he also he just he puked on people's shoulders a lot. <laughs> just, but it was like green puke that didn't smell that bad. You're, you're painting him to be a not very good police officer. <laughs> yeah, you know, he did his job really effectively. He just had these like character quips. It was like, hey, right. oh, and he would like he would he would start to tear up, and you'd have to pat him on the back. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, he was not on the dry squad, the division of police who were responsible for enforcing prohibition, but he had been on several raids and seen a bootleggers operation in action. He came to two conclusions. One, bootleggers made a lot of money. And two, bootleggers were incredibly unorganized, and he himself could do a better job. So Olmsted, who was making a decent living as a police officer, became part owner of a small business called the Shipyard Service Station, where he and his business partners would sell, quote-unquote, oils, gasoline, and accessories at the docks. Mm. This was the perfect cover for importing illegal hooch from our neighbors to the north. Yeah. Canada. So wait, what, did Canada ever have prohibition? Not that I know of. So they, oh, I didn't know that about Canada. That they are a different country with different laws? Yeah, no, I knew that. Well, but no, like, I always thought all of our booze was coming from hill people in, you know, Alabama. Some of it was. So I think if you were in the American South or mm-hmm. some areas on the East Coast, uh, the, most of the alcohol would have, would have probably come from moonshine. But here, we're just down the Puget Sound yeah. from Canada. So, so it's just port to port. It's a very easy trip. To import alcohol from this, Canada. So the guys, the guys, they, all they had to do was get across the border and legally buy a bunch of booze? Yes. That's way easier than what they had. Than making see. stills in the yeah. mountains? Yeah. Yes, and exploding it definitely your is. cousin Leonard every, every it, <laughs> definitely. Oh, years. Leonard. Yeah, he gets exploded. Uh, Canada offered an endless supply Leonard of inexpensive. Leonard was tender age. <laughs> he was 31. <laughs> he was very tender. <laughs> Canada offered an endless supply of inexpensive, inexpensive and easily accessible alcohol, which could be brought down by boat to the Puget Sound, blending in with the hundreds of other boats in the dozens of harbors along the coast, mm-hmm. to be unloaded and sold at an exorbitant markup. Yeah. Yeah. Olmsted's operation was going quite well. Money was pouring in, and no one was the wiser. He had brought in some of his fellow police officers to aid in the enterprise. Most members of the police force were accustomed to having a drink after their shift, and Prohibition did little to change that for a great deal of them. Seeing it as an unjust law, the thinking among many officers was, might as well make a buck off this while it lasts. So, oh yeah, they, they had a drink after, they, would they do this at home, or would they go to a speakeasy? Yes. Oh, both. Either one, yeah. Okay. A lot of times they would go, the, they would have an arrangement with the speakeasy where they would, they, when they, before Prohibition, they would go to a bar and have a drink. And after Prohibition, they would go to a bar, have a drink, and collect a bribe. Oh. So it, it ended up being a nice little lucrative Was the drink for free? Enterprise. Probably. Yeah, I would think that they would waive the $4 or whatever. Yeah. $4 would have been an incredibly expensive drink back then, though. Yeah, it's true. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, they probably would not have been, here's your bribe, and that'll be... 75 cents mm-hmm. for the for the whiskey. Okay, what did they drink? Whatever was available. I mean, I'm sure they they had fully stocked bars. Okay. Did they have 7 Up? I don't know when 7 Up came into existence. Okay. So, sorry. I'm just trying to imagine myself as a cop in that at this time and I drink whiskey and 7 Up. Mhm. So I might maybe I would have been sober. Yeah, maybe. No. I doubt it. No. I don't, I, don't, <laughs> I don't think you would have been. <laughs> Okay, well. Yeah. In March of 1920, Olmsted and his co-workers were unloading a shipment of Canadian whiskey from a tugboat on an isolated beach north of Seattle, when they were set upon by the dry squad. Mm. Olmsted fled the scene, but was arrested later at home. He claimed that he had been scouting the quote-unquote real bootleggers and preparing for a raid. But they saw through his ruse, and he was arrested, pled guilty, kicked off the force, and fined $500. How much was $500 in that time money? A lot. I think it's multiplied by about, I don't know, maybe 20? What is that? Come to? <laughs> 20 times $10,000. Something like that. Yeah. yeah. I, I I believe that's about. I'm just pulling that out of my head based on. So it's like he got fired and got a DUI. Essentially, yeah. Yeah. Essentially, he didn't serve jail time, but yeah. he got kicked off the force and he got a fine. Mm-hmm. Uh, his that, arrest. Hold on. Wait a minute. That, that makes, that's an important thing. If you could make more than $10,000 bootlegging, it, then it's totally worth it to get caught a couple of times throughout your career. Yes. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Economics of situations. Mm -hmm. Uh, His arrest gave him two things, publicity 
and free time.、Mm. He was immediately beset upon by people who had read his name in the paper, begging him to be their supplier of clean Canadian alcohol. No longer needing to report to his day job at the police station, he dedicated himself full time to rum running. I like this guy. Yeah, I figured you would. Yeah. No longer having a job on the police force, bootlegging became his main source of income, which meant if he wanted to make more significant money, he would need to expand his operation.、Mm-hmm. This guy,、um, they should make a Breaking Bad about this. I, it, there are some parallels. Yeah, yeah, yeah definitely. Uh, he ran it like a legitimate business. He had investors, lawyers, sailors, drivers, accountants, salesmen, and of course, police officers on his payroll,、mm. with a fleet of boats and cars supporting his organization.、Mm. At one time, he was the largest employer of any kind on the Puget Sound. Whoa! Yeah, and they, they, then they know about him. You know, people people would have known. Yeah, he, he was he was fairly high people, profile. Everybody would have. Yeah, he was very. He, Did he, he own the mayor? We'll get to that. Okay. Because、mm-hmm. that's what that's what you do at that point is you 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 own the mayor. Yeah, you you get as lots of people on your payroll,、mm-hmm. and then no、yeah. one can stop you.、Mm-hmm. Uh, Canada quickly became wise to what was going on and levied a tax of twenty dollars per case of liquor being exported to the United States.、Mm. In order to get around this, Olmsted would buy cargo ships worth of booze and falsify the documents on the ship's manifest to indicate they were going to Mexico. By avoiding the tax, he was able to undercut the prices of other rum runners and drive many of them out of business. Like this guy, smart businessman. Like this guy, Olmsted was bringing in 200 cases of Canadian liquor into Seattle every single day and making around $200,000 per month. He was making more in one week as a bootlegger than he would make in twenty years as a police officer. Is that like a million dollars today? It's probably more than that. Yeah, yeah,、mm-hmm. a month. A month. Well,、wow. a month.、Mm-hmm. Of course, there were other bootleggers around the country manufacturing and exporting alcohol and making tons of money. The difference was Olmsted detested violence. He forbid anyone in his employ to carry a firearm. He told his men, "If you are caught, bribe your way out of it. If any someone attempts to hijack your shipment," Give it to them. No amount of money is worth a human life. It is better to lose money in a shipment than die than for anyone to die. And this gave him the nickname the Good Bootlegger.、Mm. Which is not maybe not super catchy nickname, but no, the Good Bootlegger. No,、hmm. but that's interesting. Olmsted also stood for quality. He vowed that no alcohol he sold would be tainted, stepped on, or adulterated in any way. When you bought booze from Olmsted, you know exactly what you were getting.、Mm. Uh, like so many other successful criminals, Olmsted divorced his wife and married a younger woman. He bought a mansion on Lake Washington and became a well-to-do man about town, consorting with the upper crust of Seattle society. The upper crust. The upper crust. Yes. So he used to be tender. <laughs> <laughs> Now he consorts with the upper crust. Yes, yeah. So he's doing very well for himself. Yeah. On his palatial estate, he had constructed a large radio transmitter, and in one of the mansion's bedrooms, he operated a commercial broadcasting studio, station KFQX. He used it to broadcast mostly children's stories. The children's stories were used as coded messages to his operatives, giving them instructions and warnings. Whoa! Yeah, smart, right? Yeah. That station still exists today. <laughs> it's changed hands several times. Now it's known as K O M O, Como. <laughs> oh, that's Como. That's Como. That's how Como started. That's hilarious. As a、uh, as a as a broadcast warning to bootleggers. I also just think it would be funny for a bunch of like police to raid a a place where there's a bunch of bootleggers hanging out, and what they've been listening to the whole time is children's stories. <laughs> and the police are like, "Why do all these bootleggers not know what happens at the end of Goldilocks?"、Mm-hmm. <laughs> Uh, Olmsted and his men took to storing the booze in private residences. The Volstead Act, known formally as the National Prohibition Act, was put in place as a means of enforcing the Eighteenth Amendment. There was very specific wording in the act that made it illegal to enter a private residence to look for alcohol unless it was known that alcohol was being sold there, not manufactured, stored, or consumed, but sold. This offered a certain degree of protection for Olmsted's crew. They would operate out of a dummy business, but not store booze there. So when an order came in, a call would be made to a private residence where the booze was stored, requesting a delivery. Other than a phone call, there was no record on paper anywhere that made a connection between those two places.、Mm. So there was never anything written down to connect where the booze was sold to where the booze was stored. Yeah, that's smart. Yeah, very smart. 
The operation went on and on, and the list of those on Olmsted's payroll got larger and larger. Members of the police department, members of the dry squad, uh, members of the city council, the chief of police, and the mayor were all on Olmsted's payroll. The mayor's name, incidentally, was Doc Brown. <laughs> yeah. Uh, he was a dentist before he got into politics. Yeah. Okay. Olmsted had a strict pay scale where the size of an officer's bribe would correspond with his rank. But criminal enterprises don't last forever. Uh, Olmsted's success had garnered too much attention. Even though he had the Seattle Police Department and local government on his side, he still had federal authorities to deal with. Mm -hmm. Agents from the Prohibition Bureau placed wiretaps on Olmsted and his fellow bootleggers' phone lines. Around the same time, one of Olmsted's chief, o chief operatives became an informant on the promise of becoming a Prohibition agent. They now had someone deep inside the criminal organization. One of the people who worked for him was t chatting on him? Yeah. Oh. Yeah. Like, his, like his close bud? Yeah. One of his one of his top people. Oh. Flipped over. Yeah. So wait, what What else was going on? Is this like how? Should I be closing my eyes and picture, picturing like the aviator with Howard Hughes, that time of history? This is the 1920s. Okay. Yeah. Kind of the same. Yeah. You know, girls in flapper dresses and stuff. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Think, okay. Think Great Gatsby kind of era. Yeah, yeah. 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 Exactly. Uh, having accumulated enough evidence, agents obtained a search warrant for Olmsted's home and the offices of, uh, in the office of his attorney. On November seventeenth, nineteen twenty-four, they conducted simultaneous raids and seized all of their records. No arrests were made, and either with great confidence or arrogance, Olmsted continued his rum-running operation. Sure. Mm -hmm. On November twenty-sixth, nineteen twenty-four, at two o'clock a.m. Prohibition agents arrested Roy Olmsted, along with nine others, seized 240 case of, cases of liquor and a police squad car. And then they partied like mad! <laughs> yes, exactly. You know, you know when the cops confiscate your weed, they're just smoking it themselves, yeah, man. Dude. You know when they take uh, your booze, they're just going back and partying back at the station with it. Yeah. It's mm -hmm. like when I was in college and they broke up our... Kegger, and then the cops said, well, if you pay us, you give us all the money, you give us all the money that you made from selling alcohol to people tonight, we'll deduct that amount from your ticket. And we were drunk and stupid enough to believe that was a real law. Did that really happen? That really happened. <laughs> yeah, the cops came in and said, all right, well, we need we need all the money you made because it's illegal to make money, so you got to give us all the cash. And we gave him the cash and said, okay, that amount will be deducted from your ticket. Did you then get a ticket? We got, well, they were going to give us two tickets. One was a noise violation for like 200 bucks, and one was uh, the pro procuring alcohol to minors ticket or something like that. And the, the noise violation ticket, uh, just they just never filed it. It was about, we had, we'd handed them about 200 bucks in cash, and they just never f completed the paperwork. Because we showed up at the courthouse of that day, and we went, well, there should be two tickets, one under this name and this number, and one under this name. The lady was like, uh, there, that first one doesn't exist, so, uh, don't mention it again. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, oh, those guys. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. The Milwaukee police. Yeah. I hope they're not listening right now. They're, they're not. No, they're, they're not. not. They're not, no. yeah. <laughs> actually, I hang out with those guys. They're the other oh, do you? Yeah. Yeah, they're uh, pretty cool. They're pretty cool. They're listening. They're mm -hmm. actually right here with us. So. Oh, wow. Great. Yeah. Great. Yeah. I was wondering what those guys were in Milwaukee <laughs> Police Department uniforms. <laughs> well, they wear Sitting them. in the corner. They wear them all the time. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, over the coming months, more arrests were made, and 90 defendants stood trial in the conspiracy hearing. Whoa. 43 either became witnesses or fled to Canada. On January 19th, 1926, 47 defendants reported to have their day in court. When the verdicts were brought in a month later, 21 people were convicted, including Olmsted. Mm. He was sentenced to four years at McNeil Island Federal Penitentiary and fined $8,000. That... Seems pretty lax. Pretty low? Yeah. Mm, for for a massive criminal conspiracy? Four years and... $8,000. $8,000. And he was making $200,000 a month. Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. uh, he began the appeals process, which ended up having a much larger impact on history than any of his bootlegging. Uh, he argued that because so much of the evidence against him was acquired by wiretapping, it was a violation of his Fourth and Fifth Amendment rights, prohibiting unreasonable search and seizure and the right against self-incrimination. Yeah, sounds right to me. Yeah. Uh, the appeal went all the way to the Supreme Court. Mm. And in Olmsted v. United States, 1928, the Supreme Court ruled 5-4 
that wiretaps do not constitute violations of the Fourth or Fifth Amendment, making them admissible in a court of law. Fuckers. Yeah, the precedent still holds to this day. Bastards. So whenever there's a wiretap Fucks. connection and they use it in court, it goes back to Roy Olmstead. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Jerks. Yeah. You're not, you're not in favor of that, are you? No. Being able to use wiretaps? No. I couldn't tell. I wasn't sure. <laughs> All these nerds running everywhere. Everybody in the Supreme Court's a nerd. Alex <laughs> Grindelin, anti-nerd. <laughs> yeah. We just need to have two political parties. The nerds, and I don't know what the other one is the called. The not nerds? The not nerds. It seems like <laughs> you're kind of advocating maybe a system that we already have, although I don't know if you call them nerds and not nerds, but we do have a to yeah okay we need system. like yeah, okay i don't know this is not a fully fleshed <laughs> really <laughs> yeah I've, I've 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 only got about nine pages of my um uh, your manifesto manifesto written out uh it's not even ready for to be for me to put on the internet. no please read, read, read the prison okay. read, read what you've got you've got it you've got it right one. here in front of you here yeah, so uh, page okay on page one here i have the letter n in size 72 font and then you turn, if you will turn to page two, turn to page two there. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Very good. That is the letter E in size 72 font. Okay. Yeah, I see it. All right. And okay. Turn to next page here. Mm-hmm. Next page. Okay. It spells nerd. <laughs> oh. Those are the first nine. Spoiler alert. Yeah. Jeez. Yeah. That's the first N E R. That's the first four pages. Mm-hmm. Um, <laughs> what do the next five say? Uh, the next one is blank because there's a space. Mm. Uh, mm-hmm. uh, and then it's the next ones are F U K E M. Nerds. Fuck them. Yeah. Very <laughs> well thought out. Yeah, you said it wasn't fleshed out. Yeah. You, come on. Yeah, uh, you're right. Olmsted served his time in prison, where he converted to Christian science and came to believe that alcohol was a detriment to society. What? That's what he did? That's what he did. I don't like him anymore. You like him when he's when he's the head of a criminal organization, but you don't like him when he's a, no. just a mild-mannered Christian scientist? He's all tender again. Yeah, he is tender again. He used to be, he used to be hanging with the high crust. <laughs> uh, he was released in 1931 and became a carpenter, spending his free time. Oh, co- <laughs> what? <laughs> I, I, I accept Jesus. I'm going to be a Jesus. <laughs> I, think, that's what Je- I don't think he said, I accept <laughs> Jesus. I'm going to become a Jesus. <laughs> that's, if you become a super mega Christian and then as soon as you get out of jail, you're going to become a carpenter somewhere deep down inside. That's what you're thinking. I'm going to become a Jesus. All right. And, and continue. I feel like your, uh, your stance on religion was about as well thought out as your stance <laughs> on politics. Uh, he was released in 1931 and became a carpenter, spending his free time teaching the Bible, visiting prisoners and leading a ministry. That's all stuff. Jesus did. <laughs> that's all Jesus stuff. Okay, continue. Okay. Uh, he was given a presidential pardon on Christmas Day, 1935. Jesus did not get a pardon. Jesus never got pardoned. Yes, that's so. You really, you really just kind of checking off, checking off the leg. Yeah. Jesus did it. Jesus didn't do it. Happened to Jesus. Didn't happen to Jesus. But everything except for the pardon. Yeah. Jesus did. Uh, he lived as a model citizen the rest of his life and died in 1966 at age 79. How, what is the, um, adjective to describe that age the uh it's a, a septuagenarian because octogenarian is 80s right so septuagenarian would be 70s I, want, I wanted something like tender oh uh elderly how no that's not at, good at the geriatric age of 79 oh, that's fine okay you that's, that's good enough that's good enough i don't i don't care about this guy anymore i don't like him he was a, he's a flip-flopper he's a okay yeah he's a nerd flip-flopper a nerd flip-flopper yeah hmm uh, the 18th Amendment was repealed in 1933 after 14 years of federal prohibition. Wait, who pardoned him? Uh, he was pardoned by the president. Which, oh, the president, you say? Oh, in 1935, so that would have been Roosevelt. Roosevelt pardoned him? Yeah. Okay. I think Roosevelt did pardons for a lot of people that were convicted of... Uh, of booze stuff? Of, yeah, alcohol-related stuff that happened during prohibition, yeah. once prohibition was repealed. Yeah, yeah, makes sense. Mm-hmm. Uh, so yeah, after it was repealed, the 18th Amendment was repealed in 1933 after 14 years of federal prohibition and 19 dry years here in Washington. Mm. And these days, you can buy alcohol anywhere, 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 anywhere. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay. So in summary, let's see here. He was tender. He was tender. He became awesome. Yes. Uh, and then. 
and then they caught him and in prison. I need to know more about what happened in prison. He's in prison for four years, and he goes from awesome to now I'm going to be a Jesus. Well, I mean, he was already something of a pacifist before he went into prison. Yeah. He, he was he was totally against violence. He was not a violent man. He did not let any people carry guns. He said never kill anybody, bribe them, give them, give them the booze if they try to hijack you, run, use yeah, my yeah, name. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, so he, I mean, he was a criminal, but he was... He said use my name? Yeah, he said use my name to people. Did I miss that? When he was, well, when he was on the force, when he was still bootlegging, he would, he would, he would try to do anything he could to get oh. people to not... To not hurt each other. To not hurt each other, yeah. Was there, I mean, there, so there, if, if he did that, there must have been a lot of people in his organization doing that. You know, like, they just kind of thought, oh, I'm doing something illegal, it's a cop show. I'm That's be- probably how he ended up getting caught in the first place. How he got caught. Which, which would be likely. When he was, when he was still on the force. When he got the quote unquote fine. So, so somebody told on him? Most likely. Yeah, because yeah. he, t- he told them to. Uh, yeah. Possibly. Okay. Well, we, we don't really know. I don't really know what, yeah. who exactly. We just know that the police raided this, this landing, mm-hmm. bringing in alcohol from Canada. Yeah, somebody, somebody told on him. Yeah. yeah. So probably, that's probably what happened. Or maybe the police were hanging out on that beach, <laughs> having a party with a bunch of booze they confiscated. Yeah. And it was, they were just like, oh, this is easy. Here they come. <laughs> oh, they're bringing more booze. Sweet. Let's, Let's yeah. beat up these nerds. <laughs> But so it, who are the nerds in this situation? <laughs> that's the thing about nerds. They, uh, they're, they're in that situation. Yeah, the police were definitely the nerds, but they didn't know they were nerds. So they were, they were covert nerds? Covert. Or? Coverts. Coverts. Yeah. So the, they were the nerds going after the nerds, but the nerds were trying to stop them. Well, cause, okay. Or the nerds were buying alcohol from the nerds to sell to the nerds. There's been many times in history when. <laughs> okay. Non-nerds needed the organizational acumen of a nerd, right? Mm-hmm. And you, so, uh, you, you think about like all the the bullies in a high school. Who they're kind of they're assholes, right? There's nerds and there's assholes, and then there's um, I don't know. Okay, no, keep going. The theater this kids. Is, we, we've learned your stance on politics and religion, <laughs> and now we're learning your sociology. Yeah. yeah so, and so, but the the the. They're the mus- so the, the, mu- you know, there's the muscle and then there's the nerd who controls the muscle. Um, oh, okay. Um, the Mel Gibson, uh, the, uh, Master Blaster. Little Master Blaster, the little one on top, he's mm-hmm. the nerd. And then the big guy that he sits on top of is, uh, you know, not a nerd. Okay. So you have a, a nerd, non-nerd dichotomy? That's what this is a really sto- a story about. This is this is basically a metaphor for Thunderdome. Yes. This this whole so this is what Thunderdome you think was based on? They started writing a movie about No, that's stupid. That's it's yeah, not, that's just on, dumb, that's right? That come on. There's parallels, but it's not a it's not based on it. Yeah. Uh yeah. I but I do like I oh, I, I liked the guy through so much of the story. Well, you didn't like the last act. No, I, I don't like when he went to prison and just, and Became well, reformed. Well, okay, wait, 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 wait. He's, he, he's, they, maybe that was a political move by him because he still had all that money, right? Uh, I don't. I, that, I, 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 I'm sure he still had some money, but there's no way they could have seized it all if he's making a million dollars a month or more or whatever. Equally, about two hundred thousand yeah. dollars a no, month. No, when, yeah. when it was when it was said he was making it. Well, the, the uh, organization was making organization, it. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So okay, he had a lot of people under his payroll, but yeah. he was still doing very. I mean, he was at the top <laughs> of the pyramid, so he was still doing very well. Yeah, and he lived on what they described his estate as palatial. Yes. So it's big. Yes. Yeah, that's a big word for big. It, it is a big word for big. Yeah. yeah. So uh, he was doing well, and he was all that money had to stay off the books. Or maybe it didn't. Maybe because he was uh, bringing in his company was in theory bringing in uh, oil and oil accessories or whatever they said that that he was it was all on the books. Oh, that he was he was he was laundering it. Mm-hmm. He probably had multiple sets of books. Yeah, because he, he, he I'm sure I'm sure that when he got out of prison, he still had some money. Yeah, left over. I'm sure they could not have because he was only fined eight thousand mm-hmm. dollars. And so if he's making tons and tons of money and he was fined eight thousand dollars. Why did he need to be pardoned if he was already out of prison? Uh, I think he was paroled. Oh. So what, He got out on parole in four years. What does it mean to, 
be on parole. Well, pardon also, I mean, you, you, you get your conviction overturned, you, you're not an ex-con anymore, you, oh, can, yeah. you can vote. Oh. There's certain restrictions that you have if you're, if you're out. I don't know if he was out on parole or if he was just fully released, but I know that there's certain things that ex-cons can't do. Yeah, I don't think you can leave the country or it's really hard leave to the do country. It. I don't think you're even allowed to buy alcohol, but that oh. wouldn't have been an issue for him. Yeah. Because he didn't drink anymore. Yeah. He didn't, yeah, he, he, he was, uh... Okay. He was completely reformed. He thought alcohol was a detriment to society. Really? Yeah. Oh. Oh. I, I wish that, that he had died in a blaze of glory. Wow. Really? <laughs> yeah. You, ra- you, you'd you rather have him die than live a quiet and content no, life here's, here's, until the age of 79. Here's a better story. Until the age. geriatric age of 79. I'm changing the story. Here's what he You did. choke. This is, what, this is what happened. Okay. This is um, I, or, um, this is for the Hollywood version. This okay. This is where it's better. He, do, he does all this. He's in the police force. He real, sees he's a smart guy. He figures out there's all his money to be made. And he starts running it better than anybody else. And then and he tells everyone, don't be violent. Don't use violence. Don't use violence. Mm-hmm. And then at the end of the story, just like at the end of every single episode <laughs> of um, the karate show, he has to use violence. Like, you know, and uh, and then he goes, then he, to save a, uh, his beautiful somebody, somebody beautiful, uh, he's forced to, and then he dies. What, what specifically does he do to use violence? Um, uh, okay, so wait, let's see here. Uh, okay, well, there's somebody on the force that's real bad, like, in, in our version of the story, he's real bad. <laughs> mm-hmm. um, and they have this position of power that they're abusing. And they send, say, threatening things to... Did he have kids or just a wife? Uh, I am not sure if he had kids. Oh, yeah, he had kids. Okay. He had kids. They, say yeah. threat, they say, oh, threat, they threaten his wife and his kids and all this. And he's like, I can't use violence. But then the guy somehow has his wife and kids in a place. And he's like, you turn yourself in or your kids are going to die. And he goes to, with the intention of turning himself in. But the guy decides he's going to kill the kids anyway and get everything... Um, and so then he has to use violence and then he, in, in the act of taking down the big bad guy and saving his wife and children, uh, die, dies in, um, and it's, and it's raining. And it's raining. <laughs> it's yeah. raining. Yeah. Cause that, cause it's raining that way. The gunshots look cooler. Yeah, they do. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, a huge thanks to my guest, Alex <laughs> Grindelin. Uh, we have learned his stance on nerds! politics, religion, nerd, sociology, and how history should have gone. What was uh, that sh- the kara- what's the karate show? Kung Fu? Kung Fu! Kung Fu the Lady. Yeah, don't yeah. use violence, don't use violence, don't use violence. Then and then use, use violence. violence. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, you can catch Alex at Comedy Sports in Fremont mm-hmm. every Friday and Saturday night. There's shows. Uh, more information on seattlecomedygroup.com. Uh, this has been the Seattle Files Podcast. Again, my name is Chris Allen. Like us on Facebook. Uh, subscribe. Subscribe and rate in iTunes new episodes every Tuesday. If you have a topic suggestion for something you would like to hear, shoot us an email at theseattlefiles at gmail.com. Thank you for listening. We'll be back with another episode next Tuesday. All right. Next Tuesday. All right. Next Tuesday. All right. Next Tuesday. All right. Next Tuesday.